This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. Renting an apartment. You will hear two men talking about renting an apartment with a third man. On this occasion only, the first part of the conversation is played twice. Before you listen again, you have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 6. Hi, Jack. Sorry I'm late. No problem, Peter. We're still waiting for Mike. So, what do you think about 96 Hobson Street? It's great. You don't think the building's too noisy, so close to the motorway? It depends which apartment we take. What are our options? At the moment, there are two apartments available. One on the fourth floor, the other higher up. Do they get views? Apartment 1520 does. Last night I went online and took a virtual tour of the building. One thing I noticed was that three-bedroom apartments have only one double bedroom. Mostly that's true. But apartment 414 has two. What about bathrooms? A single bathroom in each apartment. And balconies? 414 has two small balconies off the bedrooms. The kitchens in the tour looked good, but I can't remember whether they come with a dishwasher and a washing machine. Yes, they do. The kitchen in 1520 is quite small, but there's a large L-shaped living room to compensate. I know Mike's got a car. Is there a garage? Secure parking is limited to tenants who pay over $600 a week. How much is the rental on the apartments you saw? 414 is $450 and 1520 is 610 That's quite a difference. Yeah... And 1520's only got one double bedroom, right? Uh-huh. But it's facing away from Hobson Street, so it'll be quiet and Mike's car would be safe. Right. I'm planning to sign the lease on Friday. The agent wants it to start in the second or third week of March. I'll be away until the 8th. All right. Let's have it start on the 9th. The 9th sounds fine. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 7 to 10. Looks like Mike won't be here for another 20 minutes. That's a pity. I wonder if we could use his car to move. I'm sure we'll be able to. My dad said he'd lend a hand too and he's got a truck. That'd be good. With a truck, we could move everything in one go. He's also got lots of stuff he doesn't need anymore. Plates, bowls, pots and pans and a big old wooden desk. I doubt that a large desk would fit in any of the bedrooms. 
What we really need is a couch and some things to decorate the living room. When I rented last year, we spent lots of time before we moved in choosing nice furniture and decorations, but we neglected the basics like rubbish bins and cleaning supplies. Then there was the problem that some people gave us weird things, like a device my aunt bought for chopping onions. I mean, all you need is a sharp knife, right? Yeah. But we did do one great thing, which we should try again. We invited the neighbors to lunch one Saturday. Complete strangers. What about the cost? The meal doesn't have to be fancy, and not everyone we ask will come. Why bother? Especially when I'll miss the football. It's just a way to show that even though we're students, we're generous and approachable. Okay. And it does pay off. One night I came home in a taxi very late. Suddenly I realized I couldn't pay the driver because I'd left my wallet somewhere. So I ran upstairs, knocked on my neighbor's door, and he lent me some money. Lucky you. All right. To sum up, we're borrowing your dad's truck. We're accepting some useful things from relatives, and we're getting to know our neighbors. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 Beekeeping for Beginners You will hear a man talking about beekeeping for beginners. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Good morning. As you may be aware, all over the world, bees are under threat. For their survival, the goodwill and hard work of enthusiasts like you is vital. Today, I'll present some facts about bees and beekeeping. Then, I'll show you a Langstroth hive, which is a type commonly used by beekeepers. Bees and bee products can be eaten and beeswax used to make candles and cosmetics. And of course, bees pollinate plants, so are essential in agriculture. There are many kinds of bees, solitary and social. Social bees live in colonies in the wild and can be cultivated in hives. The word eusocial describes the organisation of bee society. It's spelt E-U plus social. It means there's one single reproductively active female to several males. It also signals a division of labour and cooperative care of the young by non-breeding individuals. In addition to honeybees, there are eusocial ants, termites and naked vole rats. Before humans cultivated honeybees, wild colonies were raided and sadly this continues today. In Spain, 8,000-year-old rock drawings depict such raids, while Egyptian tomb paintings from 4,500 years ago show domesticated bees. However, the ancient Egyptians did not understand bee society and killed most of their insects in the quest for honey. 
Hives with movable parts that ensure continual honey collection and the safety of the queen were designed just 170 years ago by the American Lorenzo Langstroth. It is only in the last 300 years that the functions of the different parts of a bee colony and of the three types of honeybees themselves have been understood. A queen honeybee is the largest and most important member of honeybee society. She lives far longer than the other bees, up to three years, and her pheromones control the colony. Drones, or male honeybees, make up around 10% of a colony and live for just four months. They mate with queens and forage, but do little else. Female worker honeybees, constituting 90% of a colony, have a mere six-week lifespan, yet they are the busiest creatures, guarding, cleaning, nursing, fanning and foraging. The queen lays eggs after she has been inseminated by a drone while flying in the open air she can lay up to 2,000 eggs at one time. When unmated queens hatch from those 2,000 eggs, they will fight to the death, or one will fly away with a swarm to form her own colony elsewhere. The beauty of a Langstroth hive is that a beekeeper can separate out the laying queen and easily kill egg cells containing potential queens. So let's look at some slides of a Langstroth hive. I can't open my own outside as it's winter and not much is happening, but also because we'd all need to be wearing good protective clothing. Bees sting, remember, and their venom is poisonous. 2% of people who are stung experience an uncomfortable allergic reaction and without medical intervention, a tiny minority die from toxic shock. Anyone who'd like to keep bees must first determine their allergic reaction. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, here's a Langstroth hive with nine elements. It stands at 1.5 metres and contains extractive boxes from where you take the honey and a brood chamber where the queen breeds. This hive's got two extractive boxes, but you can build it up to five. The hive is wooden with a cover and a stand at top and bottom. There's always a wooden lid letter B on your diagram, and if keepers collect venom, there's a sheet of glass below the lid. The extractive boxes are shallow because they're frequently handled. They hold 30 kilos of honey each, and a beekeeper couldn't lift one if it were any deeper. The thin screen beneath the lower extractive box has holes that drones and worker bees can crawl through, but which are too small for the queen. She, therefore, remains in the deep brood chamber where the eggs are laid. The final element above the stand is a board that prevents other animals from getting inside. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 Research into essay writing
you will hear two postgraduate students talking to their professor about their research into academic essay writing. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 26. Come in, Sylvia. Come in, Jim. How are you? A bit tired, actually. I read 75 of the essays about smoking over the weekend. And you, Jim? I'm fine. I've read 20 so far. They're pretty interesting. A really good sample for our research. Yes, I found them stimulating. On the whole, their content is rather good. The students have done a fair bit of research. That's true and they quote from reliable sources. The problems are more with style. Many of the ones I read seemed like oral presentations instead of academic essays. I'd agree with that. For a start, some of the vocabulary was inappropriate. Take this sentence from a conclusion. To get smokers to cut down or give up, there should be more ads on TV about the health problems, etc. Yes. Students forget that get and most phrasal verbs are spoken. Also, they need to steer clear of should and must. When a writer has a hypothesis to prove, he or she doesn't want to put the readers off with such strong language. A writer needs to use verbs like could or might instead. And avoiding adverbs like always and never is a must. After all, you never know when you'll be proven wrong. Absolutely. Over the years, many colleagues have challenged my academic papers. I see you've circled etc., Sylvia, on several essays. Etc. is okay in note-taking, but not in academic writing. Here's something else related to vocabulary. It's part of an argument about why people start smoking. At least, I think the student's written smoking. Maybe it's smocking? Go on. Men who avoid cigarettes may be assigned as nerds. This ideology makes them dare to join in smocking activities to let us know they're real men. That is interesting. I mean, there's an attempt at sophistication with assigned and ideology, but they're both used incorrectly. And nerd and real men are slang. Going back to the word smocking... I read five essays out of 75 in which students wrote about smocking. I must say it made me chuckle. What it does reveal is the danger of spell checkers. They can't alert a writer to words that really do exist. What exactly is smocking? Here's a dictionary definition. Ornamentation on a garment made by gathering together a section of material into tight pleats and sewing across it to make a pattern similar to a honeycomb. It sounds old-fashioned to me. Yes, I had it on a dress when I was a girl. Whatever was it doing in an essay on smoking? Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 27 to 30. So, let's discuss what good academic writers do. How do they avoid the embarrassment of writing about smocking? Simple. They check their work. They write second and third drafts. In redrafting, they also reduce redundancy. Redundancy is a major issue. Listen to this. Secondhand smoke not only affects smokers, but also people around them, even loved ones, like wives and children, and it can lead to illness. What would you have written? Secondhand smoke can lead to illness. Six words instead of 24. Good writers also avoid personal pronouns like 
I or me. After all, they're trying to construct universal arguments, not just give their opinions. And they put in or take out any capitals, commas, hyphens, or apostrophes where needed. Some of the essays I read certainly needed more paragraphs. They were hard for me to follow. Indeed. An essay is not just about showing what the writer knows. It's about giving the reader an enjoyable experience. So, when do you two think you'll be ready to start the theoretical part of your research? I'm not sure. I'll see you next week about that. I've already started, but I've got so much to read. It seems to me, Sylvia, you've collected more than enough essays to analyze, and now you're in danger of reading too many academic articles. I'd limit the time for your theoretical research to one month, okay? Thanks. That's sound advice. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 Road congestion and market failure You will hear a lecture on road congestion as an example of market failure. Before you listen, you have 45 seconds to read questions 31 to 40. Sorry I'm late. The traffic was unbelievable. However, my lateness is pertinent to today's topic. Road congestion as an example of market failure. Next week's examples will be carbon emissions and commercial fishing. But what is market failure? Broadly speaking, it's when the free market fails to develop or apportion resources efficiently. A market may fail completely or partially. In the case of complete failure, resources cannot be allocated to satisfy need or want because there are insufficient incentives for profit-seeking firms to enter the market. Take street lighting. Without state intervention, there probably wouldn't be any, as it's unlikely private individuals would pay for it themselves. With no revenue generated, and no profit earned, no firm would enter the street lighting market either. That's why taxes are set aside for public goods. There are many ways in which partial market failure occurs, but I'd like to focus on oversupply, which is when markets produce too many goods or services. It commonly occurs with demerit goods, like alcohol or tobacco, and with negative externalities. What are negative externalities? Well, the inability of consumers or producers to account for the effects of their actions on third parties. Road congestion is a classic case. Oh, let me tell you something I read last night. The speed of traffic in central London has remained fairly constant over the past 100 years. Really? How can that be? Wasn't most traffic horse-drawn in 1916? Indeed, it was. 
But the fact remains, in central London, giant four-wheel drives and sleek sports cars travel about as fast as wagons pulled by horses. Back to business. There are four main ways of dealing with congestion. One, a city increases the amount of road space. Two, it improves public transport. Three, it reduces the demand for travel. Or four, it increases the cost of private travel. In the case of London, the first measure is counterproductive. There are enormous costs associated with construction and a long delay between planning and availability. Once built, more roads only encourage more driving and very soon congestion rears its ugly head again. On the surface, improving public transport seems a great idea. But even when it's reliable, cheap and convenient, it's viewed as an inferior good. As incomes rise, most of us leave inferior goods behind. I mean, we used to drink beer. Now we drink boutique beer. We used to holiday locally at the seaside. Now we fly to Thailand. What about reducing the demand for travel? Unfortunately, no one seems to know how to do this. The fourth option, raising the cost of private travel, has also had limited success. In London, we've experienced higher vehicle and fuel taxes, more expensive parking and licence fees, no parking routes and a raised driving age. But we've kept on driving. Other big cities have taken a different approach. Some Chinese cities limit drivers to four days a week, based on the final number of their license plate. But the rich just buy two cars. Sydney and Singapore have tolls on bridges and tunnels, yet people pay up or drive longer routes to avoid tolls, creating traffic jams elsewhere. In 2003, London opted for a congestion charge in the central city. Back then, the charge was £5 a day. It's now 11 50 From its inception, there was a discernible decrease in traffic. Estimates in 2004 by Transport for London, or TFL, were that traffic flow was reduced by almost 20%, or 50,000 cars per day. Journeys were 15% faster. The number of bus journeys rose by 15% and cycle usage by 30. TfL stated that road traffic reduced a further 10% between 2011 and 14. However, a recent report has concluded that by 2031, congestion will have worsened by a staggering 60%, even if strict measures are adopted immediately. It seems as though the cycle is similar to building more roads. A sharp initial improvement, a slower improvement over time, followed by stasis and decline. So, to conclude, part of the reason for road congestion is an unquantifiable negative externality, exemplary of partial market failure. The free market is incapable of allocating resources efficiently. No matter what authorities do, people continue to drive. On some level, we all know congestion leads to more noise, pollution, accidents and slower travel times. But cars are cheap and their outlay is fixed. Principally, we drive because we don't consider our actions in relation to anyone else's. And even if we did, I'm not sure most people would care. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.